just note that uh, we got it. <clears throat> Yes, so welcome everyone to the Rebirth webinar, fifth edition. This is our fifth installment of the Rebirth webinar series. I will be one of your hosts for the day. My name is Rispa Wanja, and I will be joined by my, by my co-host, Leslie Mwangi. I think you guys have seen us together for quite a number of times. Leslie will be introducing herself in a few. Um, for now, allow me to welcome you to the discussion that we will be having today, which is how do you thrive in a rapidly changing world? How do you thrive in a rapidly changing world? And the theme for today is how to stay ahead, you know, from the many, many changes that have been going on from taxes in this country to global financial crisis, to living in a post pandemic world, to having war in Ukraine and all of these things are affecting us to a lot of changes in technology from chat GPT, other changes such as, you know, like, you know, every single thing that is happening in the medical fields, in the technology fields, in the sustainable development fields, there's literally a lot of changes happening. And the question is, how do we stay ahead? I read this quote that once said, you know, you can either fight change or you can learn how to adapt to that change. And so we want to know from you who is here with us today. What are some of the great changes that you have faced? We want you to think about them so that um, as we continue with the discussion today, we are able to address some of the questions we have. But so that to join Nani Ako Kwanyumba, Yani, who is with us in this particular call, we want you to do your introductions. Please write in the chats your name and where you are doing this call from so that we can celebrate you, so that we can read out your name. So let us know your full name and where you are doing this particular call from all right so as the charts come in i think the last um sort of form of introduction i would like to do is to welcome you guys to lapid leaders africa we are a leadership development organization that is committed to igniting progress in the next generation of African leaders and African change makers. So as you are here, just know you're exactly at home. We focus a lot on talking about things that affect young people, such as um, such as how to thrive in a rapidly changing world. With that, I myself, I'm Rispa Wanja. I am a growth associate at Lapid Leaders Africa. And now I will introduce sort of or invite my co-host Leslie to let us know who she is okay. really and welcome all of us. Leslie Karibusana. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Larispa, and a good afternoon evening to you. Thank you guys for joining us. Uh, I think this is the fifth webinar and some of you have been very consistent and we appreciate you for that. Thank you for joining us. We're very glad to be with you today. <clears throat> and we're very excited for the conversation. Like Rispa has mentioned, we want to delve into this conversation and talk about change. Change is scary, but then they say the only consistent, the only constant thing is change. So we want to look at what change really is and what it looks like at the faces or <clears throat> the spaces we are in our lives. My name is Leslie Wanjiro. We've been together. I think this is the third webinar that I'm hosting. I work as an accountant as a, a quantity survey firm. So basically, I know a lot of you know what an accountant does, but I maintain the company's financial health and stability by making strategic financial decisions. I also try to implement financial policies and procedures. I uh, also provide financial analysis and kind of sort of guide the management on the finances. That is generally what uh, an accountant would do. And I try to do it to my level best. Uh, Again, we'd like to welcome you to the session today. Uh, I hope that you are very pumped for the conversation. If you have any questions, if you want to hear anything to do with change, our guest speaker, as Arispa has mentioned, is Esther. She, we had her uh, for the last webinar when we were talking about young entrepreneurs. And uh, we, we got into that conversation, which was very insightful. Like you we all figured she's very, she's such an insightful person. So if you have any questions regarding change, and living in a VUCA world, kindly just share them on the comments and we'll share 
we'll read them out. You might not be able to read all the questions, but we'll do our level best to respond to most of the questions that we you will have asked. We appreciate you a lot so much. Thank you. Please tune in. If you have a friend who you know might be interested in such a topic, kindly just share the link with them. But before we get into that, I'd like us to hear a poem from Maya Angelo, who was a big uh, enthousi enthusiast and a big poem. Uh, a po sorry, a, po a big poet. They're called a poet, yeah, and a big poet. So uh, I'd like to welcome Gloria. Gloria Uma is the one who will be reading out the, the poem from Maya Angelo. Gloria, are you with us? Are you on the call? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Thank you so much for passing the mic over to me. As she said, my name is Gloria, and today I'm honored to be reading a great piece from one of the greatest poets ever. This poem is called Still I Rise. May you write down in history, may you write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. May you trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Cause I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room, just like moons, like suns with a certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Did we lose her or it's just me? Mm, we okay. might have lost her momentarily. Um, that's okay maybe before she gets back on uh, I'd like to hear from us uh, what we would like to hear this evening and I think I had a question uh, maybe even before we get into the conversation what is the most significant change you've undergone and what what would you like the guest speaker to talk about today in terms of thriving in a rapidly changing environment or world we appreciate the comments that are coming in and your introductions. But then maybe let's try and respond to the question, what is the most significant change that you've had undergone in the most recent past? Whether it's in school, in the university, or at work, what will you say the most significant change that you've undergone so far? All right, Leslie. I can see I can see a few people that have joined us. As, they, as we continue with the interest, I hope to see some of the greatest significant changes people have gone through. But just to bring you up to speed, we seem to have Javan Waita, Kenya. Uh, Javan Waita, please let us know where you're doing this call from. I see we have done here yet um, from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm a South Sudanese. Okay, that helps. That sort of helps us understand the name. Um, Leslie, we also have Lean Wanjiko from Nakuru, Kenya. Oh, you are to Queen. Welcome, Lean. <laughs> Yeah, uh, then we have we have Abigail Oma. Hello, I'm Abigail from Busia, Kenya. We are so happy to have you here with us, Abigail. Uh, we also seem to have Lin Wanjiko from, um, we also have uh, Masi Wango in Daiga from Kiambu County. Wow, Karibu Sana Masi. We also ha have Eva Evelyn Jerry from Nairobi County. We have Paul Miner joining us from Nairobi. We have Naderia Marilyn from Mombasa County. We have Elizabeth from Nairobi, Simon Peter. Hey, Leslie, we have a lot of people here and I appreciate having all of them. So I see we have Gladys from Nairobi. We have Javan Waiter is actually from Machakos, Moses Kuria from Nairobi, Samson Kinto nice. from Kinto County. Yes. And I think with that, Simon Peter from the Dankimati University, Karibuni Sana. Um, yeah, you know, this is your alma mater, yeah? <laughs> yes. The um, Dankimati so University in the house. Okay, I'm not from there, <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, yes, I celebrate everyone. I see that Gloria is 
back. I think we yeah. can, so yep, you can please read back the poem, then we will get yeah. straight into today's conversation. One of the best things that's happening to me today is, is that I get to read this poem twice. Um, so here we go. You may write me down in history with your bitter twi twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Yanni, this poem is refusing to be read. We shall no, not- No, she wants to read it thrice. We see her, <laughs> we see her. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll do this one last time so that we, we get to the conversation. Gloria? I'm so sorry. Uh, there are some guys who are like doing a lot the most out here. But for the third time, mm. you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may throw me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you so besset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room like just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides just like hopes springing high still i'll rise did you did, did you want to see me broken bowed head and lowered eyes shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by my soulful cries does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awfully hard? Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? <laughs> Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the hearts of history's shame, I rise up from a past that's rooted in pain. I rise, I am a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Thank you. Woo! This is where you, you put it. <laughs> this is where we no. put the hands up emoji reaction. That is such <laughs> a powerful poem. And it Gloria, is. thank you for being the one to bring the words of Maya Angelo to life today. And with that, I can see Onyango Emmanuel reacting. I think all of us have at some point interacted with the work of Maya Angelou so to hear it it's a rise and it's very in theme with the conversation we are having today which is how do we stay ahead and how do we thrive and succeed in a rapidly changing world and this brings me to introducing today's guest who is Esther Moniki. Esther is the founder and CEO of Lapid Leaders Africa. Before starting Lapid Leaders Africa Esther was a you know was a consultant and a financial guru still is today with the powerhouse that was price waterhouse coopers that is pwc worked here in kenya for about six years for secondment to the united kingdom after that esther has moved on to building on her love for africa and the and the future of this continent through its young people by being a civic innovator who is now internationally recognized by the Obama Foundation and the Oprah Winfrey Foundation, um, given that she was an Obama Fellow in the year 2020, 2021, and now holds a master's degree in public service from New York University, courtesy of being an Oprah Winfrey Fellow under the Oprah Win Winfrey Fellowship for Women in Public Service. So with that, I would like to just sort of call Esther onto this call and welcome her. Esther, if you can hear us, please say hi so that we know that you're here. Hi. All right, so as Esther comes in, actually one of the biggest questions I want to find out from her is that she has moved profession from very different, you know, how do you move from finance 
to or from audit to finance to uh, you know being up here and down you're in the united kingdom then you're teaching in amsterdam then you decide with all of that amazingness happening and all of this great opportunity happening how do you then um decide that you want to fully focus on your beliefs and your civic innovation and your conviction and decide that you will start a platform and an organization that is geared toward igniting progress in the next generation of african leaders all right so as esther comes in esther you have a lot of people waiting to hear from you and i can see you know leslie maybe from you i would want to know from from you Leslie what is one thing you would want to hear from Esther you know in this call uh before before she comes on I think uh thanks actually for that question because that is exactly what I was thinking about um uh, of late I've wanted to transition I am not as bold as Esther I will not move from finance to public service and you know one thing I say about Esther she embraces what, what she preaches you know so when she says that she embraces a squiggly career. She's not afraid of moving and exploring what other areas have to offer. For my case, I want to move to investment. Actually, I think I have a passion for storytelling, but then I still want to see how can I marry finance and storytelling because I am so afraid. I'm only three, I'm not even three years into my profession. I'm only like two and a half years, but then I'm like, they want to start at entry level again. It's very scary for me. And mm -hmm. she told us a lot of times to just draw away the ladder. You know, how the, the notion that we've had for, for the longest time, you're told that you get into the career or the marketplace and you told you get uh, you're getting as an entry level, then maybe you move on to become an associate and maybe a senior associate. That is what has been ingrained in us for the longest time. And after joining Lapid, I have wanted to embrace it and I I now want to move to investments and then see how I can do storytelling at the same time, but it's very, very scary. So I want to hear from Esther, how is she able to do that? How is, isn't she afraid of, uh, am I throwing away all this? And uh, and uh, what, what if it doesn't work out? And it, for her, it, it seems so easy. Now I want to hear, is it is it easy? Or how does she go about embracing the changes and wanting to know what other spaces have to offer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much with that. Esther, I can see you're here with us in the call. Karibu sana, and we want to get into your introduction. First, you will tell us some of the work you do, what motivates you, but primarily I want to know from you, why is it important that we should be having a discussion today about changing in a rapidly changing, like how do we thrive in a rapidly changing world? Why, why is it important for us to have that conversation? Karibu. Thank you, Rispa. Thank you, Leslie, for that introduction um, and for those questions. Um, allow me to step back and start with Rispa's before I come to you. I mean, uh, with Leslie's before I come to yours, Rispa. Um, is it hard? Yes, it is supposed to be hard. <laughs> um, there is a conversation we were having with somebody this past weekend around what's called the S curve, which is sort of the process which everybody goes through in terms of learning. So it was created by somebody who was trying to figure out how product products pick up. And he, I think it's called Segmoon Curve. So it's named after the guy. And he, to busy, I even had some place to illustrate this, but just to see, think of an S. And that's the process that products take in terms of picking up. So they start at the bottom, they struggle, they then form a flow, and then they become masters in their journey. So if I think about think about what a phone product, Oppo, Apple, went through the same process, started at the bottom for, from a flow, then became masters. But at the place of mastery, it's very boring for most humans. And so that's why products constantly think about how do we return people here? Because unless you keep returning people to the bottom and then they form a flow, mastery is the cycle of products. That same cycle of products is the cycle of human humanity. And at the bottom, it's, it's uncomfortable for products. It's uncomfortable for human beings because you're not winning. You're a student. We like to win. Um, but the, to answer your question, in the final end, if you stick with it over time, you get a flow and you become a mastery and then you come back because that mastery is not like life is that cycle of an S-curve on a continuous basis. 
at the bottom of anything, it will always be hard. So taking it to stay ahead. If you think about what's happening today, you have quite a bit of changes. And in effect, it's almost like we are at the bottom of the S curve. And it's uncomfortable. It is, if we could all walk away from it, it would be even be easier. But over time, it becomes a flow. I mean, when you think about all the things that we live by today, at some point, they were at the bottom of the S curve. Like, at some point, it was hard to use phone. At some point, it was hard to use emails. I was talking to somebody who was telling me how when Gmail was introduced, it looked like this magical thing that was, people even spiritualized it. It's the cycle of life. Um, and, but I do understand the difficulty of when you're the lowest part of the S curve. I think what helps me is my faith, number one. Number two, what faith does is it teaches you you've gone through this S curve many times before. You will be fine. And so building that muscle of you start, you pick, you hit it, but you stick with it. Um, last year, I spent most of my time in a foreign country, the challenge of the bottom S-curve, uh, S-curve um, lapping starting bottom S-curve. But over time you learn, I got out of it and I mastered it. And so that data is, is in your brain. And what that does is it means that you're able to tap into that data when you're starting afresh. So perhaps, Leslie, what you need to do is start to do data of starting afresh. You could start small, but over time, we could figure out how you pick it up. Rispa, with regard to the conversation around stay ahead, why it's important. The, my sense is being perhaps one of the biggest shifts um, that has happened in a very long time. The, within... Um, there's a lot of studies going on in this, but the world has gone through many shifts, but mega shifts have been economic. So sort of moving from the agrarian revolution, then moving to the industrial revolution, moving to the knowledge age, which is what we basically are in at the moment and also transitioning towards the post-knowledge age is perhaps where we are at. It's, um, it's a mega shift in some sort um, with a lot of things going on. And let me just, sort of just name a few, at, at the top is of course technology. So if you think about what's going on within the technological space, we have not seen that kind of fast shift ever before. And it's not just that you have technological changes, it's that within technology, things are changing really fast. So easiest example is AI, but it's not the only thing happening, but AI is the one which is on top of our faces. It's the world of chat GPT. Today I was interacting with, I'm trying to create, um, a content calendar for something else. And it's, there's a, ChatGPT does all those things for you, but there's even additional like plugins that have been created that say you create your calendar. In addition to creating your calendar, you automate it. It's an opportunity that just automates it so that it just goes out at whichever time. And that means that technology is, we've talked about this for the longest time, that there is this thing called artificial intelligence. It's important for us to call it what it is. Artificial intelligence that would one day come up. I think what happened with the pandemic, it accelerated it. So I remember in 2020, listening to the CEO of Microsoft in the US, and he was talking about how in just one year, they saw changes that they hadn't seen in 10 years. And he predicted that in the next 10 years, we'd see more changes than we've seen in the last 100 years. And I think that's sort of what you're seeing today. When you think about the fast pace at which AI is unfolding, um, your machine learning, um, your blockchain, and just that whole space of technology and how fast it's moving, it just means that that time is here. But it's not just in terms of technology. It's in terms of the climate change. And I'm very keen on bringing that as we talk about the, the technology changes, it's that we're talking about, and this is science that has been done, that the next, within seven years, if we don't figure out climate and figure out um, the impact of the climate change, we will live in a world that's horrible in effect. Um, and so the fast pace at which the climate is changing, the sea levels, the droughts that people are seeing uh, are another significant change that's happening in our day. Um, if you think about the social changes, we talk about how nowadays people work remotely and that happened really fast. Um, if you think about the social movements that have come up in terms of in the recent past, you've had your Black Lives Matters and you have other matters that are sort of uh, arising. But it's that you you're living in the middle of the world saying in the world that we live in was sort of built during the industrial age. And it's almost to say this world doesn't work anymore. 
I mean, uh, that sounds doomsday, but in many ways it's outdated. Um, the education systems that we have, the transport systems that we have, the work systems that we have, and just that process of digital moving towards your whole digital move, your whole a sustainable move is what you're seeing happen, but also happen at a very fast pace. So too many words to say mega shift. The people who will be affected the most are us and the people who are young and sort of um, emerging professionals. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the comprehensive response. And I honestly can't think but uh, but question these, like you mentioned, there are a lot of things that are happening that they've happened in the recent past, like in the very, very, very recent past. And how do I find my place and what to venture into with all this happening with the AI, this climate change, there's so many things that we have just been told and a lot of information. How do I find my place? And how, at the same time, how do I ensure that I'm not, I do not have some sort of information overload? Because there are times I find myself overthinking about everything and trying to find my place and what do I focus on? And with the news and a lot of things happening with corruption and you feeling maybe the world is not a good place, who do I talk to? So how do I find my place, one? And two, how do I ensure that I'm not distracted by too much information? Those are good questions. I will forget them. When I forget them, you will remind me. <laughs> but I think let me first start with the first one of how do you find your place? I think when I was reflecting on this, one of the questions I asked myself is what does staying ahead mean? Because I think that's an important place to start. Um, and what is staying ahead not? Because I think in the process of figuring out this shift, it's easy to get into a competition that says I'm staying ahead. And is that really staying ahead? And is there staying ahead when you're running someone else's race? Um, I think that's a place to start as we talk about this staying ahead and sort of just asking what we need to do to survive. I think for me, I remember a while back and I was reflecting on this today, but I remember a while back I was uh, driving from Thika and I was headed to town and I kept seeing my tattoos moving from one lane to the next lane. And then I got to Utali and they were just a kilometer away from me. And I kept thinking, you have risked all these lives. Um, but that's what happens when people have this chase in their brains towards something that's often illogical. And so for me, when you think about staying ahead, the first place you have to start with is who am I and what does success look like for me? There is no bigger time to be grounded in self-awareness than now, because there is a hundred thousand things you can do. There's a hundred thousand things that you can be. There's a hundred thousand things that you can chase. And, and so you must do the work of defining me. What, who is Esther? What matters to Esther? And, and be able then to stick on the lane that I can keep up with. I have zero need to keep moving from one lane to the next lane because I'm chasing the next big thing. And so I think for me, the first place, as you think about this shift, is finding yourself. That's the biggest job. We This past weekend, we were hosting um, a friend of mine who actually, she's a teaching, she teaches in Stanford and we met um, in Stanford. And she was talking about um, a book around the power to lead. And one of the first things she talks about is before you change anything, you must understand the rules of the game. And I think for me, what that speaks to is being grounded. And so I think the long and short to your question, Leslie, is people have to be grounded. And grounding happens in understanding yourself, understanding your values, understanding what drives you, and making peace with those things, because those will then become your true north that constantly leads you to where you need to be in a world where the possibilities are 100,000. Um, I think for me, that's the most important thing. And as part of that process to define what does success look like for you? Um, in, in a place where there are matatus, where we're all running after, I am all right with taking two hours on Thika Road. I actually am, because I'm not chasing that matatu. What I'm chasing is after the things that matter to me. And those things will take time. Those things are built around character. They are built around my values. And so I have zero need to run after that matter too. And so that, if you ask me, is the most important thing in a very fast changing time. 
defining yourself, finding yourself in the context of what matters to you. Um, I am sure I've only answered your first question. I don't know what the second question was because I have forgotten. <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the question, uh, the other question was on how do we avoid, how do we stay focused? And I feel like you've answered as, as long as you've been able to define what is important to you and what aligns with your values, then you are going to avoid all these other distractions. Uh, I see you have a hand up, Rispa. Do we unmute them for the question? Um, um, no, for now, for now, what we can ask, Emmanuel, you can drop your question in the chat. We're going to make sure we address as many of us as we are, we are able to for now. Maybe Esther, I would like to build on the conversation you have started around, you know, staying ahead in your own lane that it's based on self-awareness first. And we wanted to see, so how do I not get overwhelmed in this world? I have so much information, you know, that is coming to me every single day. Something I've heard you talk about constantly, but I would want you to mention here is how does this affect our mental health and how do we protect ourselves even in the process of trying to stay ahead, trying to find ourselves and keeping up in this sort of crazy world? Yeah, um, I think that's important. So one of the things that we have to be aware of which is, has happened almost naturally. We live in a work education system that was built industrial age and was very built around the owners of capital and logic. I mean, so the question was, what does it look like for Esther to become a worker who helps the owner of capital to become rich? I mean, there's a package that, but that's the long and the short for it. And what that did is it means that the focus of everything was on logic productive. Like logic was what drove everything. And what then that lost is you're a human being. It doesn't matter what you shape. You're fast human. And so the place for fast changing is building the emotional resilience to survive today's world. And emotional resilience start with sort of, I will keep going back to the self-awareness because there's nothing that gives you resilience than, than that. That sense of purpose, that sense of self, gives you a high level of emotional resilience. But also then based on that, to do the work of understanding the experiences that have shaped you. And we do this quite a bit within LAPID because we recognize that people report to places based on their history. Um, the, there's a conversation we were having um, yesterday around mindsets and change and on Saturday, around mindsets and change. And we were sort of borrowing from the, principles of neuroscience to ask how do people get through um, times of change? And a, a big part of that is understanding where you come from and how that has shaped you. Um, and that's from a global perspective in terms of what is the world like, but also from an individual perspective. And that tells you, these are the things I'm likely to struggle with and therefore, then there's a principle we talk about in Lapid a lot around naming it to tame it. Then you learn to name the emotions that are driving every single space that you are in. So uh, we're in the middle of mega shift. I am afraid of being left behind. So you name that. But in addition to naming that, you ask, why am I afraid of being left behind? What experiences have I gone through that make me so, so imaginative of the idea that we're all running after each other? And so that allows you to start to sit with your truth and then be able to nay and tame the things that are chasing after you. So my sense, and just and this is very high level, but just to say the bigger things in this season is around understanding yourself, building the emotional resilience to be able to survive a world that's fast changing uh, is, is, the, is the long and the short. I probably not say the things that we normally say. I just am saying the ones that I'm remembering. Please feel free to add the others. No, thank you. I think uh, I, I like how you say, or uh, how grounded you are to know that everything starts from within. Everything, all the answers that you need are from within. Just find yourself and find what you want for you and what success means for you. And then now move from there. Then now yes. go look. Thank you for summarizing it so well, Leslie. 
Because I think the, the bigger headache is we live in a time when it's easy to look at the external inside. This is the truth. It doesn't matter. Two things. One, Google is going to go. Like, you know, those things. I'm told me I face truths too hard go. Me, I do. I have no attachments to truth. They just are here to come and go. Google will go. There's even a good chance in a very short period of time. I mean, think about it, especially people using chat GPT. When was the last time you Googled? Um, so, and they're gonna try and put up some plugs to be able to get chat GPT installed in it. And then many people are building outside that. So like there's a school can, can, academies building within chat GPT and as a teaching assistant. So over time, this whole thing for Google will go. But the reason I say that, imagine we have been chasing that. Now what happens? We are lost. And I say that to say that it's easy in this day of technological advances to get caught up in what's the next big tech IT thing that I need to know. You, you, do, you need mostly to know who you are, get frameworks. My conviction is if you're coding in a few years, maybe even months, it will be relevant. Now that sounds horrible. There will be... ChatGPT is already doing this. Like it's creating for us this code, go and put it here, and then you will have the results. So the external risk, as easy as it is, will not be the answer. Yeah, that's that's beautifully said. I remember that I was very resistant about ChatGPT. I remember even having the conversation about comfort, back and forth with you, saying I don't want to be lazy. What happens to my thinking mind? Then you told me to just adopt a, a growth mindset. And now we are moved on. Chat GPT is like, I even have a bookmarked it on my on my Google. <laughs> but uh, I, I hope that you guys are enjoying the conversation. I am, because I am. And like we said, we had promised a very insightful conversation and we hope that you're delivering that. Uh, I'd like to mention that we have the intake, the July intake and the next cohort is coming in in July. So if you're interested in joining in, uh, just share with us your details. And again, we're going to share the details or the application link. So just tap on that link and somebody will follow up with you. If you have any questions regarding the conversation, regarding how to join Lapid, uh, regarding anything to do with the team, just ask us on the on the on the questions. And I really appreciate that we are we've kept the chat box very, very engaged. I don't know if we will go into the questions. Or do we move on for now, Riz, but then maybe come back to the questions? Um, we can move on for now, but perhaps I'd like to read something that I have seen. Self-awareness, who you are, what you're capable of, um, that is what will keep you grounded. I can see a lot of those thoughts coming in. And maybe perhaps, Esther, what I would like to ask you next as we continue on this conversation, how do we stay grounded? How do we stay ahead in a world that is rapidly changing and it's dynamic all over the time? I think one of the biggest um questions would be, um, as we go through all of these changes, what are some of the most significant challenges you have seen young people face when trying to stay ahead in this rapidly changing world and how do they overcome them? I feel like you have touched some of them, but yeah, what are your thoughts on that from your experience as well? I think what I would uh, say to that, and I'll borrow from what Leslie just said, um, so we were having this conversation around chat GPT in one of the classes, and I think there was those who are fast adopters, and there were those who are called laggards, which is normal. Mm. It's very normal. But I think that is one of the things you find among young people. Um, in Lapi, you talk about the cheetah generation, and you find the asset is that people adopt, generally speaking, many young people adopt things really fast. Mm. And what I would advocate is for us to figure out how we leverage on that. Um, we have somebody within Lapid, I don't know if she's here, if she's here, she should put the link within the chat room, who she, her self-awareness held that made her aware of the fact that she doesn't have high levels of self-confidence. But one of the other things we talk about, we call them the five C's, is you need to figure out what content you want to be able to release. So she had content but she didn't have the confidence to build the content, to release the content. So what she ended up doing is going to chat GPT and creating a ask, 
I mean, doing quite a bit to figure out what a script would look like. Um, and then putting that script into another AI tool that converted it into an avatar. And then the avatar was speaking um, about how, what she wanted to, the conversation she wanted to have was around mental health and black self-care. Mm -hmm. So the, the point I wanted to make before I talk about the challenge is we have some things that work for us. And the things that work for us is we are fast at adopting. And we should leverage on that to be able to distinguish ourselves. The challenges are that we have Leslie's who will not adopt very fast. Um, and I would tell us the same thing that I told Leslie. Though when the world is on a move, you have to have a high level of agility. So even before we talked about this season of um, the technological advances, I think in the early 2000s, the US Army came up with a terminology called VUCA that we live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous world. And the idea behind that was it's no longer straightforward. And then when people asked, how do you survive what's called a VUCA world? One of the bigger tools is you need vision, which is why I keep talking about the self-awareness, which is the V, but then you need agility. If you don't have that capacity to adapt really fast, you will struggle. And you will struggle with things that you can have the capacity as a young person to, to change. So training yourself to be agile, training yourself to be adaptable. And that sounds easy in paper, but in reality, the best places to train yourself such things is in the presence of communities. Uh, one of the things that we were talking about recently in one of the um, programs it is we have what we call Ubuntu circles and we form Ubuntu circles because we believe in the power of community and community then becomes almost like healing circles and I love a quote that says that we are each other's medicine and what that says is Leslie can be stuck and thinking oh my god I hate chat GPT but if she's in a community the community can be her medicine and so though Coming back to your question around what challenges we find young people having, one is the isolation and the idea of I can be a star by myself. The, that is going to destroy your life. The, in a fast changing time, you want to be part of communities they help you remain grounded. They help you without even you knowing. Because it's almost like the conversations that you're having, they constantly come back to you. Um, one of the things I am very passionate about is the fact that in Lapid, we, we attempt to build communities among the cohorts that we have. And that's for the students. But even for me, I am very intentional with the same things. Because you cannot be able to survive in today's world as a loner. Um, and so that's one of the challenges I find. Another challenge is, and this is again related to the emotional awareness. We have come from environments that have taught us to be stars. And so there's a lot of competition, a lot of isolation, a lot of um, competition. And, and I could say the competition like 10 times. Well, in reality, if you adapt a community kind of perspective, then you have people who are able to give you feedback, people who are able to um, direct you. So that whole idea of isolation and competition is one of the bigger things that I find a lot of young people are struggling with today. Um, and then that becomes increased stress, increased pressure, um, overemphasis on short-term thinking. Let me talk about that. You, if you then are on competition mode, you're chasing the matatu that I started with. That matatu is irrelevant. I met with it at Utali because that's short-term thinking. Today, the big thing you need to anchor yourself is on long-term thinking. And so to ask, where do I see myself five, 10 years from now? Based on what you know, it will change. But based on what you know today, so for example, let's work with Leslie. Leslie said she's a storyteller and perhaps where she sees herself is um, building financial literacy using stories as an example. And so the thing becomes in five years, I want to build platforms that educate people on financial literacy principles using storytelling. Now that is important for her because then she's grounded on one big thing. 
And then she doesn't today need to abort everything because now she has something that she's working towards. And so she then puts together steps, gradual steps that are working towards her building that platform of financial literacy using storytelling. So that whole idea of vision that then converts from short-term thinking because short-term thinking is what has a sense of emergency. Short-term thinking is what has a sense of comp competition. Short-term thinking is what has a sense of, oh my God, the world is ending, imagine. It is not. Understand yourself, understand the vision, put in the time. Um, and then over time, you then build the stories which is where Leslie you started, which is where Rispe you started. How am I able to do it? Ah, the stories in my mind. But those stories are not created today or tomorrow. They were created by years of failure, years of learning, years of mentorship. Today I am still, I still sit under people. And my first coach in 2004, in my first job, is still somebody who is able to speak into my life today. Because I have taught myself that it takes time. And because I understand that it takes time, I don't have an emergency to clear things. I have an emergency to be constantly learning. Mm -hmm. Well, that is very powerful, Esther. Which brings me to the question, perhaps, of what is the power of continuous learning? You have just mentioned it. And I want to know, as you tell us also the power of continuous learning in managing to stay ahead, what does that practically look like also? You know, it's one thing to be told, oh, I don't know, go continuous learning and it sounds very nice, but maybe some of us could be lost on what does that actually look like for someone who is starting out? Um. So two things, one which is what you asked and one which is the one I had. <laughs> um, but I wanna first, one of the first thing I wanna highlight is, I think today's world, one of the biggest skills people need, two big skills is continuous learning, of course, but also critical thinking. Um, if you ask me what will make a difference in a world that's changing really fast, it's your ability to think. Um, when you think about, which is why people are arguing that their current education systems are not relevant, and I agree with that. Um, though, when you think about me going to cram about what, how many countries America has, as an example, how many countries, how many counties Kenya has, ChatGPT will give me that information in two minutes, two seconds actually. And so the idea is not information, the idea is thinking through information. So I see people struggling with, I was having this conversation with a good friend of mine the other day, and she was talking about how now there's a whole app around what kind of prompts will give you results. So there's ChatGPT, and then there's a whole field that's coming up around prompts. How do you write prompts that give you results? And you know, I don't understand. It's intuitive in my brain. But I remember her saying, part of the problem is we haven't done the work of building critical thinking. So chat GPT is your assistant in effect, and it gives you information. But if you haven't built the critical thinking, you're not able to sit with the information and ask, is this information going to help me? And so I think one of the bigger skills to build today is around critical thinking. And then the other one is around continuous learning. And continuous learning says, I may not know how to do coding today. If I need to do, I will. I may not understand um, how to create content. If I need to, I will. And I like what you were saying, Rispa, a couple of weeks ago around the people who are wealthy today, they are creating wealth from new spaces. It's not the same wealth that has been created before. It's primarily actually through social media. But what you find behind a lot of these conversations is critical thinking. It's that you have a platform, but if you don't have critical thinking, the platform cannot serve you. So this weekend, I'm a fan of Jugo. She's done some sessions in Lapid. And he did this show that um, sold out at KICC. Um, and he, it was an entertainment show. The magic is, and I think that's the power of technology. Technology helps you to do day-to-day -day drama. 
the magic is in can I think through something like this and put it to work. And so that critical thinking, that continuous learning is key. How do you get those two things? Very many ways. Um, and a big part of it, we will go back, is figure out how you join programs and, and communities like LAPI, because those continuously expand your way of thinking. Because this is a conversation of mindset. I tell people, I get a lot of emails and messages about my idea. I honestly, honestly, honestly have never been jazzed by a single idea on earth. I'm not. Like, even if it is how big, I probably even charge it to then jazz me. Because I have found that ideas are the lowest level of that conversation and they are in plenty. But it's that ability to sit with things for long enough to break them down, which is what critical thinking is, to build project management skills, which is what process conversations are about, to do research, which is what continuous learning is about, that creates ideas. And so be, becoming part of communities that challenge you to grow that. And I tell people that's, I feel like for me, this world, I saw it a while back. <laughs> and I remember when I started Lapid and I would talk about these things, it sounded very ridiculous. Like it just sounded like this person, what is she talking about? What world is she seeing in her brain? And unfortunately I could see it very clearly. Um, I knew there's a time that's coming when the way of thinking matters more than what you know. I mean, so from the word go, our programs are built around that. I mean, and with such intentionality, so to answer your question, how do you continuously learn? It's exposing yourself to people who think in diverse ways. So exposing yourself to an Esther, to a Leslie, to a Rispa on a continuous basis, but now even people who are thinking on a higher level than you on a continuous basis. Um, it's experiences, taking up projects that ordinarily you wouldn't take up. I like what this current court is spending time on. They were doing, they were doing videos around what are the opportunities within Africa using AI and did some fantastic research um, and some, some fantastic summaries around it. Um, it's experiences like what we do in terms of sending students on Africa experience and Africa experience is a study trip where we send people outside the country. What does that do? Broadens your mind. And so it's people, it's experiences, it's um. The time, the reading, the content that you consume that builds your continuous learning. And then ultimately your character that says I'm a student for life, that then finds the, the right ground to, um, to do those things. Well, thank you. Thank you so very much, Esther, for that. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you hear anyone in the chat and you're curious about how to join Lapid Leaders Africa. We have shared the link on how you can join Lapid in the chats and also on our LinkedIn platform. Where we are saying this is just as Esther has mentioned, to think that you have monopoly of knowledge, monopoly of ideas, and monopoly of how to change the world. It's to fight a losing battle. So we welcome you to join our community. And I would also like to encourage you, if you have any questions that you may have for Esther around how do we continuously learn or how do we thrive in a world that is changing all the time, then this is your opportunity to do that because we are coming actually very very close to the to the end of this webinar because we, we may not be able to share and get to hear every single thing that there can be around this topic but maybe esther something i would like to ask you is someone is here in this chat and they're thinking okay what you're sharing makes a lot of sense however maybe i have been overwhelmed before or I have been the isolator or the competitor. So then the question to you would be is, how can we as individuals sort of who feel overwhelmed and have maybe struggled to stay ahead, how can we regain focus and thrive in such an environment? How do we regain focus? Um, maybe Esther, before you go, I, I was mm. listening to you when you said that competition, isolation, well, this is one of the challenges that face us as young people. 
And I sort of understand why. Ever since we were young, we were told you're only rewarded when we, you came first, maybe in a position, or you only rewarded if you improved or you defeated other people. So already it's very ingrained in, ingrained in me that I need to be position one. I need to be competing. I need to be ahead of these other people for me to, to have value, to have some sort of value. So how do we unlearn and appreciate the community and appreciate insights from other people and see that we only thrive when I'm, I'm involved in a certain community that has similar ideas to mine or some people that are able to challenge me. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to, to comment on, but maybe you can respond to that, and then I'll come to the next question. Yeah, thank you, because my, I don't have the capacity to hold this one is out here. Um, so what I'm hearing is, how do I unlearn? I think that's the bottom of the question that you're asking. There are many things around that, but just to mention a few, um, we're talking about, I talked about the neuroscience of change, and we were one of the key principles of that is just the neuroplasticity, how flexible the human brain is, is one of the magical things about life. Um, we are created almost capable of going and coming back. Um, just the human capacity is. So I hear, um, let me talk about, for example, AI. I think there is a lot of conversation around responsible AI and, and I agree with them fully. Um, there is a lot of things that AI could do that could be hazardous and is actually hazardous. I actually think Africans need to be careful very much. Um, I was listening to a video where people are using all these tools to talk about say the problems in Africa, but there's not one who has my ascent. Like there's not even a single robot that has my ascent. They are all Chinese, British. There has to be one that has my Kikuyu ascent and my shrubbing ascent for this world to belong to me. And, and that's to say that there's a whole conversation around responsible AI that's going on, that's necessary. But I think also, um, we underestimate the human capacity, the for good and bad, <laughs> the that we can sit with a powerful tool and create bigger things. Um, that's how we think about how we've been moving. It's just the human capacity is great, and so though to come back to you. And the question that you ask, it's sitting with actually your capacity, Leslie, Rispa, and many others in terms of unlearning is endless. And that awareness is important because it means you, you are not limited in terms of um, what you're able to do. It is yourself to do the limitation. And that's where then you get into the conversations around the fixed mindset and the growth mindsets. Because once you... I mean, there is study around it. Um, when you think about neuroscience, oh, that's the whole concept around neuroplasticity, but also the growth mindset. And people have done humongous studies, studies around this. And even I can tell you myself, though I started out as an accountant. At my heart, I'm still an accountant. I analyze things with such ease. I look at data with such ease. Um, my analytical mind is extremely developed. But also, and at that point, I never thought of myself as a creative. And I think I do quite a bit of creating today. Um, and if you think about accountants and the analogy around accountants, there's a lot of conversation of we are analytical, we are not creative. Actually, I've discovered my superpower as a person is I can, I'm creative and analytical, both. Um, I can create, I can analyze. And, and I don't think that that's just my capacity. I think it's the capacity that's built when you make room for growth mindset, that I am capable of constantly adjusting, um, becomes important. I also think that you need to figure out spirituality. I think that um, increasingly you see even those who are not Christians, people want to be grounded on something that's bigger than themselves. And so you're finding people are going back to Eastern um, religion and you're talking about, you're hearing people talking about meditation and all the other things. 
Why are they doing that? There's almost a recognition that a human is limited and is unlimited and yet limited. Um, and that ability to anchor yourself on a bigger power than yourself creates room for a lot more than you know. And the last thing I want to say on this, I was thinking about creativity in the recent past. Um, now, when I think about creativity, because I think that's one of the bigger tools that people need in today's world. And I was asking what makes some people creative and what makes some people are not creative. So let me use RISPA as an example. Um, RISPA is serving as our growth associate. And I actually think RISPA has made quite a bit of progress in terms of the things she's created within Lapid. Um, she has been able to put together this webinar. Um, she's been able to interview several other people. She's been able to put several things. I mean, she's, if you ask me, she has a creative gene in her. Um, and, and what I was asking myself is, I've seen, I've worked with many people, but I've also seen many people struggle creating the things that she's able to create. Um, and I was asking, what enables a creative to be a creative? I actually think Leslie also a creative, you just haven't fully tapped into it yet. Yet is the word. Um, though, and there's several things. Well, creativity is spiritual. I do believe that there's an element of creativity that's very locked unless you understand it beyond yourself. So I'm a Christian and I understand the world through God's word. And I, one of my favorite uh, things is to think about the story of creation and God uh, in Genesis saying, let there be light and there was. I think creativity is that process of let there be light first because the, and the mind has a lot of good things, but also it has a lot of, history, a lot of experiences that say, let there be darkness. <laughs> and there's no creativity without darkness. And so I personally think creativity is a spiritual process that starts with let there be light. And so for example, for me, one of the practices I have in my own life, when I wake up in the morning, one of the first verses I read to myself, has that let there be light. And for me, I can tell actually when there's light in my brain. <laughs> So I think creativity is spiritual. No, no, no. I don't think creativity is emotional because it's spiritual. It's your mandate. You are uh, the main last of person. You are the only distributors of the Naka. Okay. Who is hosting the uh, the session? They may want to mute him. I think they've been able to mute him. Um, I think also, creativity is spiritual. I think creativity is emotional. You can there's a state that you need to be able to create. And I think also creativity is physical. So you have to do work in all those three levels to be able to create. How do I look after my spirituality, my soul? How do I look after my mind? Um, some people, and, and that's why the I think one of the bigger tools in the coming seasons is therapy, coaches, those are industries that will continue to be a big deal because we need to do a lot of work in our mental, emotional state to be able to create. And then it's physical because if you're really spiritually, emotionally, mentally, but you don't go and do the work, you will not create. I don't know how I got into that question, by the way. <laughs> um, but I do hope I have answered a question that you asked. <laughs> What was, but then what was the question? I'm sorry. Hey, Esther, it was about and learning and learning what has been in I have answered your question. You have, you have 100%. <laughs> Hello. Oh, you can hear me today. Today, the, the mics decided they are not unmuting. Um, but, but we are back on track. Um, Esther, I think I would like to first and say that I think this is very insightful because the question I had for you was now around 
how do we regain focus? You know, if you have been someone who's been caught up perhaps in the, you know, the danger of a single-sided story, I could have told myself for a very long time that I am overwhelmed or I don't learn or I I don't I don't agree with all, all of this internet and changes things. So my question was around how do we regain focus? And I wonder whether you have any extra thoughts besides what you have shared with Leslie around and learning. <laughs> no, you'll be unmuted in a second. <clears throat> yeah, but maybe as, as Esther is unmuted, if you have any questions, the conversation we are having today is, how do you stay ahead? And how do you thrive in a world that is changing faster than we think we are capable of maybe keeping up with. And so far we've had such powerful insights and now we want to look at how do we regain focus? But if there are any questions you have for Esther, now is the time to do that. Secondly, if you are curious about how to join our community of how you can grow, how you can be in a space where you are challenged, but also supported in your growth, then you are in luck because our July intake is currently open. And to apply to our program, someone is going to share with you in the chat how you can apply to our program. They're going to share the link. And if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us on all our social media platforms and we will get back to you. Esther, back to you. How do I regain focus if I'm someone who perhaps has, you know, sort of gotten lost in the madness of everything that has been happening around? I think the, the same principles will apply. Um, find yourself in communities. They will allow you to see what you don't see because often it's that you have a mental block. Um, you're seeing what you call the one-sided story. You're seeing just your story. And what communities do is they expand the stories that you see. Um, I've had one of the things I like... I know we're recruiting currently for the flagship program, but we also have what we call the Crossroads program, which works with guys who have more experience. But one of the things I like about that program specifically is actually we do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And part of the part of that process is a different story. And so the power of community, if you're feeling overwhelmed, the community allows you to see beyond what you're seeing at the moment is number one. Number two, sitting with the reality of neuroplasticity, you have the capacity to change growth mindset, you have the capacity to change. Um, and then number three, equally important, just taking the time. Change takes time. And so just be compassionate with yourself because it. It is not like you will sit here and say, I've, I'll stop being overwhelmed because as I said, I stopped being overwhelmed. It just, it, it would be nice if there's a button that we pressed and that was it. Um, but in reality, you must do the work and that takes time and it takes, you fall, but then you are kind with yourself and you said, I fell, I fell into, I'm overwhelmed again. However, I am still alive. So again, back at it. Um, so that whole process allows you to be compassionate with yourself, to learn um, and make mistakes. And then the way you think about life, and I don't know where I was telling this. I don't remember. There's a friend of mine I was telling yesterday. I think about growth as, I don't know how to explain this, like almost, you know what is like that? Think about, there's a thing called, you get your brain of Wanga and uh, you like, you can see it in my brain. I don't know its name, but that's, <laughs> it's a spring. That's why I use the word spring. But it's that you, you, if you're here, growth is like you go up and then you go round and then you go up and then you grow up round. And what the reason that analogy is important, when you make the next mistake, you never go back to where you were before. And that's the place that people underestimate. So let's use the example of overwhelmed. Let's say today I'm overwhelmed and then I go through a process that makes me awake to the fact that actually my capacity is great. I go through coaching, I go through therapy, I go through communities. I realize actually I'm not overwhelmed. And so you move up and then you hit the road again. And so it's easy to imagine you went back, but actually you don't you will be at a higher level of overwhelmed. So if, for example, you used to be overwhelmed for 10 years, in the next level, you're overwhelmed for six years. 
and then the next turn you're overwhelmed for four years because you're moving up in the process. You're not in the same place. And that's what self-compassion does. It teaches you that you're constantly growing, um, even those days that you hit the roadblock, as long as you've gotten the awakening around what you needed to do work is the answer. All right. Thank you so much. And I was just thinking to myself, I feel that you have sufficiently covered some of the questions that we may have here. Um, maybe one last thing that we are curious about from our end with my co-host uh, Leslie is now that we sort of know where to start, how to rest and know that we are not that overwhelmed, we have capacity to learn. Then it's how can we proactively identify and leverage on opportunities that you know can help us grow in our personal and our professional lives i think that you may have covered that but what are some of the areas for you as as yourself as a star from your experiences yeah what are some of the places we can proactively get opportunities to grow ourselves as well as you know both in our personal lives as well as our careers I think that today we have a lot of access to knowledge and information. Um, so leverage on it, leverage on the internet, leverage on the resources that are available publicly, YouTube, podcast. Um, I remember I was telling you about sharing one of the classes. I've always been a content consumer. And I started my career with uh, PwC. The hours there were very tight and hardly had time for anything but one of the things I did that has helped me is I, I remember, I was remembering this the other day. I think it's even Rispa who asked me this question. Um, and I bought an Audible. Um, there's an, now it's more popular than it was. not this was like in 2009, 2008, actually. 2008, I was on Audible 24-7. And I liked Audible because I didn't have time to read. But I was in my tattoos. I was in, well, maybe I was, but I was on the move. And so Audible could help my life. And so there's a lot of resources that you have access to. Mm -hmm. um, but it's converting your life to be able to make use of those resources. And, 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 and not getting stuck in the realities. So some of us will say, I spent 10 hours on traffic. I was spending hours on traffic, but I was on Audible. It's just that whole conversation of how do I make things work um, is learning with using the online resources, learning through finding your people. I have found that to be extremely powerful. Um, I ran Lapid continuously without a break from 2014 to um, 2019. Um, and literally every weekend, every day was wake up, think about Lapid, do Lapid. Um, and then in 2019, I got into a community of the Obama Fellows, and I think that's what you talked about earlier. And they have changed a lot of things about me. Um, went in tired, exhausted, and I'd even stopped dreaming. But this community has, I'm the only Kenyan in that community, but it has people in India, America, uh, Brazil, like people from, a, it's a global community. And, and just hearing the things that they were doing expanded and unlocked things that I had stopped doing. Um, uh, two weeks ago, and Rispa and Leslie you know this, I was part of still one of the Obama fellows who were in Cape Verde, spent two weeks with a community of other civic innovators, just dreaming, talking about what we see as the world we want to build. And so learning through building communities is, and finding your people who constantly allow you to keep learning and growing is a second way. So online resources, second one is communities, but third one is also, and allowing yourself to know what you know. <laughs> that sounds very philosophical, but I'm a huge believer that God creates us with an intuition and we know the things that we know but we doubt them. Uh, I remember when I started Lapid, one of the bigger modules was a module I used to call Free to be Self. Um, people from court want to know just how big that module was for me and for the whole community. 
Now people have a nice name for it that's called authentic leadership. But me, I wrote it and I taught it based on the awareness that I had and the convictions that I had. And I'm a strong believer that there are things that we know that we know that are uniquely ours. Um, I personally believe, especially as Africans, that's a gift that we have. There is a wisdom that we have that's just African. And, and we need to put it to work. We almost innately know there is something wrong with economic systems that drive today's world. Yes, they call us poor. Yes, they call us black and dark continent. But it doesn't make logical sense when they extract 100% from this continent. We have a wisdom that is known. And so when you talk about sustainable development, which is one of the bigger shifts that has to happen over the next seven years, I think that sustainable development will borrow quite a bit from Africans. And there will be quite a bit of looking at our indigenous practices, indigenous knowledge, and being able to build on those. So please feed the things that you know innately. And as I conclude, because I need to conclude, I want to share one story of somebody. I hope that the link of the person who I mentioned was put up. Um, she has a YouTube channel that I'd love for us to support. She's using AI to talk about mental health and I'd love for us to support. Please follow that channel. I hope it's been put up in the chat room. But there's another one and this is a student in Nairobi University who she's putting together a platform that uses indigenous knowledge to honor the past uh, in present architecture. So she says, it's not backward that we had hats. Actually, from today's world, it's actually, we should all be using hats, especially in our environment, because they, the heat is significant and stones don't make sense in our environment. But the story we were given was hats was backward, we were underprivileged, under whatever, all those under things. And so she's using um, indigenous knowledge in architecture to design new places that are just beautiful. She designs, I remember seeing the restaurants and they're inspired by, I think, a community in Benin. And that's what she's put together into a restaurant. And that's the power of leveraging on what we know in Italy. And so learn online, learn from communities, find your people, but also learn from yourself. You know a lot of things, by the way. Learn from yourself. I think that was really big today. Find everything from within and also leverage on your community. Thank you guys for joining us today. I think we've gone uh, past our time. It's already 8 it's 20, sorry. But I see there are a lot of questions that have come in, a lot of comments. We really appreciate you. We might not be able to cover the questions because, because of time. But what you can do is that we will take the questions and then we can we'll respond on the LinkedIn. The live will still be on even after this. We'll find that if you if you log back in into the link, you'll find the live and we'll have responded to the questions. But there was a question that I took note. It's quite lengthy, but then maybe we can Esther you can address just one of the questions from the audience so they don't feel left out. Uh, it, this is from Duncan Keep Career. He asks that in every field that experiences growth every day, uh, have a lot of lot of competition, especially the characters in modern technology and industrialization. These people undergo every day, everyday learning in order to catch up with their trading system. Many of us face different challenges, including resources, which now become the limiting factor to young people. And this gives us, give others advantage to grow and learn. Uh, do you think this gap alone will bring some difference in the trade and industrialization sector? What do you think we can do to ensure equal growth, especially for disadvantageous people and nations? I remember you just called us poor, Esther. So he's asking, <laughs> how can we bridge the gap? Mm. I think she's still on and she's still on mute. Oh, she was okay, that question was too long, so please summarize it for me. <laughs> yeah. So he's asking with the current 
as as Africans, I'm, I'm thinking he's referring to young Africans who who want to get into industrialization and technology, but then we are at a disadvantage because we are limited in terms of resources. So he is asking, how do we bridge the gap, considering all the limitations that we have? Mm, that's a good question. Um, there are many ways to answer that question. Um, one is what I we say. I say often, um, please engage in politics. I am a strong believer what the late former Mo President Mo used to say, yes, ambaya, my uh, I find young people think politics are not your problem. As long as we think politics are not our business, we'll have bad politicians, we'll have bad societies. So there's no one who's coming to save us. We take the forefront seat to ask what kind of leaders do we want and how do we demand from them the things that make to us sense to us. There's a lot of land helplessness, especially in terms of politics within the context of Kenya and Africa. Um, and because of that, politics happens to us. And politics means they decide on who to tax, what to tax, we are victims. They decide whether they create jobs or not, we are victims. As long as we are victims in our own country, we are lost. And so we all have to become political is maybe the point, I, the first point I would make. If you do not know your MCA, there's a term in uh, Lapid and we need to return this, where people actually used to go and meet with the MCAs to understand, Rishma Yokon must have done that activity. It ended when we went online, it must come back. Um, and because if you don't understand politics, you have no business having this conversation. These are the people we entrust to govern us. And so we must put in place systems to engage and to hold them accountable is number one. Number two is... Please don't try and become American. Don't try and become the West. Their progress is not the progress we want. You are all at Witaki. Um, I would, there's an article that we normally read, um, and it's actually been written by a phenomenal teacher. Um, she's called Dr. Wandia Joy, and if you don't follow her, please do. And she's written an article around industrialization and how it's overrated, and I totally agree with it. And, and so to say that, I don't know what we mean by catching up, but we have to be careful by that we are not trying to catch up with what they've created. They've created a mess. They come here, they extract from us, and then go and build. How is that the thing we want to do? So we have to do the philosophical work of asking, what does success look like for us as Africans? The same way we did as individuals. What is success for us? And that's hard work. Um, and then build towards that success is another thing that I would use to answer that question. Um, and then lastly, to say the world is putting together things that equalize everybody. <laughs> um, before the digital age, the wealthiest people were the aristocrats. Today, you have people, influencers who come from nothing but they leverage on digital to become what they are today. And that's to tell you that the world is flattening and equalizing. The reason I'm a fan of chat GPT and AI in its goodness and its badness is it creates opportunity for that leverage, levelization again. I remember um, being in a uh, uh, community last year and we we're talking about fundraising and just principles around philanthropy. I think actually it was around philanthropy. And I remember sitting in that course and thinking, why am I learning this eight years into my building a nonprofit? Like, why? Why? And in fact, I remember I told the person who was running that class, we've created a world that's a cartel. And in that cartel, Africans are the lowest. Like, we get the breadcrumbs. And it's not a lie, by the way. Tunapatanga breadcrumbs. <laughs> and I remember saying and making a commitment um, that as long as God helps me, I will build bridges that say, what are the things that we need to um, know? What are the things we need to interact with from an early age? I believe the gift God has given me of acceleration has always been for myself and for the people that I work, around, I work with. But that means that the leveling is us taking advantage of the resources that are around us. Um, and so the answers are those complicated answers. They're not simple, it's engaging politics. Let's do the philosophical work of asking actually what does success look like? Let's define it in our own terms and build towards that. 
Um, at the heart of that should be sustainable development that serves the world, not extracts from the world. Um, and then as individuals to realize that we live in a time where by God's grace, not because they planned for it, by God's grace, the breadcrumbs are being spread and we now have access. I mean, how do we leverage on those access to build not for ourselves, because that's the other mistake of defining success based on Western philosophies. We will all be looking after how, how big my car is, how many followers do I have? What are those? What are those? I was in a conversation, okay, I'm sure I exceeded my time, but I remember being in a conversation in a university space and people were talking about how they went to a university and how the university is helping them. They're now thinking about what to do in space. Space, the moon space. I was angry. We have no business going to the space. Our business has to be how do we build our farming, our education, our architecture. Space is not your problem. And so just defining success in our own terms so that we're not running after the number of followers and asking what does impact in the context of, I have been blessed enough to be in this conversation. What are my responsibilities to it? Leslie, for you, it's clear. I will harass you, you until you figure it out. But it's how do you build financial literacy? Um, and risk, how does she use her creativity to serve? Because then that gets away the idea of success that's based on uh, philosophies that are not ours. I want to answer any regrets or what do you, would you do different in your journey? Okay, I have many. Um, the one that comes to mind right now is... For the longest time, I tried to fit in. I am created different. I think all of us are created different. One of the bigger things that has released me and that I like that I am starting to sit with, I still struggle back and forth, but it's the, I look to belong. I look for places I can belong, the places that allow me to be myself um, and thrive as myself and yet allow other people to be themselves than fitting in um, is something that comes to mind. But I'm sure that that could perhaps take several hours um, to get into, but one of them. I don't want to come back. So I want to say thank you um, to RISPA. Thank you, Leslie, for hosting us. Um, I think you're phenomenal co-host us. Um, and thank you to everybody who joined this conversation. We appreciate it. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you join the program. It's a phenomenal program, and that's not just because I am part of it, but it's that I know that it will change how you think. Um, so please sign up um, if you have more. It primarily works well for three years and um, in campus, campus and three years and lower. Um, if you have more than five years, please sign up for the crossroads. Let's build these communities that allow us to think differently and challenge ourselves to be in the spaces that we can make a difference in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther. Thank you to my co-host, Leslie Yani. I'm just so grateful for you. Uh, thank you to everyone that has joined us, as Esther has already mentioned. You may now feel free to leave, but before you go, please just take note. We have already shared the link with you in case you would like to join our community. We hope to see all of you guys. We are still the same people who will be serving you. I mean, how amazing are we? <laughs> Cynthia Leslie, you know, um, this is just to say that we really appreciate every one of you guys. Thank you, Gloria, for reading the poem, Still I Rise by Maya Angelou Alia. You know, the point of us is to still keep rising. And I believe that this conversation has actually at least sparked hope in those of us that have, you know, may have felt that you don't know where to start. For those of us that already had some fire, now you know the insights to use how to grow community yourself going back inside one of the best things i'm taking home by the esther that you said is what if you're staying ahead but you are running someone else's race eh, in the spirit of i'm trying to compete i'm trying to shine and be number one so as we go tonight as we go home as you go to sleep ask yourself whose race are you running we do want you to stay ahead but at the end of the day we want you to do that in your 
ultimate progress in your ultimate places of gifting. And that is what Lapid Leaders Africa focuses on. So we trust and hope that we are going to see each and every one of you. Leslie, I will give you the last word. Please say good night to all our people then. Frank will close for us, uh, but maybe that's just to say, Frank, thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without you. Leslie? Oh, Leslie is still muted. Okay, so for now, thank you so much. Leslie, I love you. Thank you so much. Esther, same case. We are so glad to have had you as our guest today and we can't wait, by the way, we still have more webinars because um, we are doing this for you. Literally one webinar per month until the end of the year because we are serious about the business of growing, about the business of your rebirth. So stay tuned so that when we tell you the next one, you'll be ready and so that you can have more such insightful conversations. With that, Leslie, please help us in saying good night to everyone present with us. Okay. Thank you guys. Oh, wow. I loved, loved, loved today. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Esther, as always, as always. I think that one thing that I've taken, actually three, three things that I've taken away from this is one, gene politics, as scary as that looks, as it might seem, let's hold our leaders accountable. The other thing is let's do the work, the philosophical work to actually define success for us. Success for us as Africans, success for us is for you as an individual. And the other thing was, Forgotten the last three. I had I had three. Forgotten. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, I think Lapid is just one of those things that I'm so grateful that I joined. And thank you for this initiative, Esther. I think I, I speak for so many of us as saying we are so grateful. And if you've not joined, even if you're not sure about it, just maybe just log into the link and ask the questions until you're very satisfied that this, this is a place for you. And then now you can join in. We have so many mm. more info sessions, it's not just this. Then ensure that you join in, in the webinars for free information. We're not charging for anything here. Free information, yes. free conversations. You have questions, you're going to, to address your questions. And then eventually, I'm sure you'll want to join us. So thank you guys. See you on the next one. We have webinars every last Monday of the month. So see you in the next one. And please share this to your friends, to people, to your loved ones, and to everyone. Uh, from me, that's Let's wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Rispa. Bye. Bye and good night.